Knight Capital. Knight Capital. Knight Capital Group. $440 million. That's how much Knight Capital said it lost. Who is to blame in the Knight Capital debacle? Is it man or machine? New details on Knight Capital. That J.P. Morgan suspended Knight's line of credit. We haven't seen any employees coming out. They've been ordering lunch in. And we've seen the pizza boxes go by. In Knight Capital's case, there's been a spectacular um, failure of that technology. The date was August 1st, 2012. As the sun rose over the New York skyline, nothing seemed out of the ordinary as pre-market trading on the New York Stock Exchange was set to click open at exactly 8 a.m. EST. At 8.01 a.m., a series of 97 total email alerts were sent from an internal system at Knight Capital, identifying an error that was merely described as power peg disabled. Unfortunately for Knight Capital, these emails were not designed as high priority system emails and were swiftly ignored by personnel. They were the proverbial smoke of the smoldering code and deployment bits about to burn. When markets opened at 9.30 a.m., it immediately became apparent to traders that something was wrong. By 9.31 a.m., the market was being uncontrollably flooded with inconceivably high volumes of orders on certain stocks. By 9.32 a.m., many people on Wall Street, even outside of Knight Capital, were wondering why it hadn't stopped. By 9.34 a.m., quantitative analysts as a part of the New York Stock Exchange itself were able to trace the surge in volume back to Knight. In response, the chief executive officer of the NYSE's parent company, Duncan L. Nidrarer, tried to call the chief executive officer of Knight Capital, Thomas Joyce. Unfortunately for Knight Capital, Joyce was at home, recovering from a recent knee surgery. These orders were vicious, bidding up the prices of certain stocks by over 10% of their original values. By this time, Knight's trades constituted more than 50% of the trading volume on the entire New York Stock Exchange. Knight was actively opening positions worth $148 million every minute. This was highly problematic, as they only had $365 million in cash and equivalents, meaning that a two and a half second period was enough to bankrupt the company, as they wouldn't be able to cover their trades. Nidrar contacted Knight's chief information officer, signaling that they should flip a kill switch, a common practice for high frequency traders, quants, and market makers. Every second their systems were active resulted in $2.5 million worth of trades that the firm could not afford. We are losing $148 million per minute. Hit the kill switch. Immediately. There is no kill switch. And no documented procedures for how to react. The engineers at night had absolutely no idea what was going on, and they were left trying to diagnose the issue in a live trading environment, where 8 million shares were being traded every minute. It turns out that August 1st, 2012 was not just an ordinary trading day, it was the day of the launch of a brand new dark pool called the Retail Liquidity Program, or RLP. Before we get into dark pools, let's first understand market makers. Every time you log on to your favorite brokerage and buy a stock, you might think that you're buying said stock from another individual that happens to be selling their shares. But in reality, there's an overwhelming chance that you're purchasing your shares from a market maker. Knight Capital engages in this so-called market making, where large traders can cast buy and sell orders into the order book of the same security, selling for a few cents more than they are buying for. With enough volume, they are able to earn a meaningful spread, which is the difference between the two prices. Market making is a service that provides liquidity to a market, at a cost, for a profit. If it wasn't for market makers, there might not be anyone to take the other side of your trades when needed. In 2012, Knight was the largest trader in US equities with a market share of 17% on both the NYSE and NASDAQ. It took 17 years to build Knight Capital into one of the leading trading houses on Wall Street, but every precious second that went by, they were closer to going bankrupt. This brings us back to dark pools. Dark pools are private exchanges for trading securities that are not accessible to the public. They facilitate large chunks of securities, known as block trading, for institutional investors that don't want their trades to impact market prices. Dark pools can allow institutional investors to transact among themselves, hidden from the eyes of the public, and without worrying about market liquidity constraints. The exclusivity of dark pools raises concerns about fairness and equality, as retail investors do not have the same opportunity as other participants. Since 2008, the proportion of all stock trading in the US taking place away from public markets has risen from 15% to more than 40%. In October 2011, the NYC proposed a dark pool of its own, called the Retail Liquidity Program. This was a restricted access venue designed to attract retail orders by offering price improvement, raising the tick size from one cent to a tenth of a cent. This New York Stock Exchange proposed dark pool was so controversial that even its own CEO wrote a public letter in the Financial Times, criticizing dark pools for shifting more and more information outside the public view and excluded from the price discovery process. 
While this was proposed in October 2011, there were months of proceedings and debates between the NYSC and the SEC before it would even have the slightest chance of approval. The CEO of Knight Capital said in an interview, Frankly, I don't see how the SEC can possibly okay it. It wasn't until June 2012 that the SEC granted approval, at which point the NYSC announced to the world that the RLP would go live on August 1, 2012, giving market makers only 30 days to prepare. Of course, no one was forcing market makers to participate, but CEO Joyce insisted on participating as he didn't want to leave profits on the table. With only a month to prepare their systems, Knight's software development team worked around the clock to make the necessary changes to its trading infrastructure, including SMARS, Smart Market Access Routing System. SMARS was able to execute thousands of orders per second and could compare prices between dozens of different trading venues within fractions of a second. A key feature of SMARS is that it would receive parent orders from other components of Knight's trading platform, and then subsequently send out multiple different child orders downstream as needed based on the available liquidity and price. There is a very important part of the software known as the cumulative quantity function, which would keep track of the number of child orders that were filled, so that when all of the shares a part of a parent order were filled, the system would know when to stop placing new child orders. So what ended up going wrong? Remember those PowerPeg emails from earlier? PowerPeg was the name of an algorithm, a part of SMARS, that hasn't been used since 2003. It was a program that would buy high and sell low, losing money on purpose, only used to test and verify the behavior of Knight's other proprietary trading algorithms in a controlled environment. It was not to be used in a live production environment. Their first mistake was that the PowerPeg code remained present and executable in the production version of the codebase, which is terrible practice. Their second mistake was that the new RLP code that was written repurposed a flag that was formerly used to activate the PowerPeg code. This flag was meant to trigger the RLP code, but now pointed to the old PowerPeg code as well. Over the years, there has been substantial code refactoring done to SMARS, with limited regression testing. In 2005, Knight Capital changed the position of the cumulative quantity function, essentially disconnecting it from PowerPeg. No one thought anything of this, as PowerPeg was considered deprecated and was never intended to be used. When it came to deployment, Knight Capital allocated eight servers for RLP. One week before going live, a Knight engineer manually deployed the new SMARS code to only seven of its eight servers. They made a mistake and left the old code on one of their servers. Knight did not have a second technician to review this deployment, and no one at Knight realized that the PowerPeg code had not been removed from the 8th server, nor the new RLP code added. Knight had no written procedures that required such a review. The new version of the code called the new RLP function without an issue, however the old version of the code would call the deprecated PowerPeg code as it repurposed the same flag. In addition to this, recall that the removal of the cumulative quantity function in 2005 was the only thing that would stop the algorithm from placing trades once the orders were filled, and without it, PowerPeg would keep on placing child orders indefinitely. When the markets clicked open at 9.30am on August 1st, on the single server running the old code, 212 different incoming parent orders were intended to be dispatched to the new RLP code, but due to the same flag being repurposed, they were now dispatched to PowerPeg instead. PowerPeg, having no cumulative quantity function to stop child orders from being sent, started sending thousands of child orders per second, resulting in 4 million executions across 154 different stocks for more than 397 million shares in approximately 45 minutes. This was a total of $6.65 billion worth of open positions, purchased at copious prices due to their impact on market liquidity. They had 48 hours to settle their trades, meanwhile they only had $365 million in cash on hand. They tried asking the SEC to cancel their trades, however they didn't fit the criteria and were swiftly denied. What would you do in a panic, unable to stop the trading? The most reasonable solution was to roll back the code to its old version, as they believed that the bug was within the new deployment. As soon as they rolled back the code, they started losing money at 8 times the speed. Little did they know, it was actually the old code that was responsible for the trades, not the new code. They just poured oil on a fire. It was not until 9.58am that Knight's engineers identified the root cause and shut down SMARS on all of the servers. 
Goldman Sachs ended up stepping in and buying Knight's entire position at a discount of $440 million, leaving them with a $440 million hole in the ground. A week later, Knight received a $400 million cash infusion from a group of investors, and the next summer, it was acquired by a rival, GetGo LLC. If you made it this far, you might be interested in checking out some of my cybersecurity breakdowns. Subscribe to the channel for more content, and as always, thanks for watching.